Good to have you all here. Thank you so much for attending. This is our Global Voices World Food Day Roundtable, a really exciting event, and it's one that makes for the Global Youth Advancement Network, or JAN, because the mission of JAN is to coordinate opportunities and to create solutions through convening um, and through thought leadership, capacity building, and content development. So this fits in nicely with our mission, and we really feel um, excited about the opportunity to support and promote this event. The theme of World Food Day 2022 is Leave No One Behind. And with that in mind, today's panel will share their reflections on global food security and sustainable agriculture. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Sam Bigley, He's a service program alumnus of MSU, and he now co-owns Clear Street Farms, an urban, an urban farm in Lansing, Michigan. Prior to that, he served a year as an AmeriCorps state member at a Central Michigan food hub, the Allen Neighborhood Center, and he went on to serve for two years as a youth development specialist in Peace Corps, Morocco. So thank you so much, Sam, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Opal. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I have the honor of introducing all of our panelists here. And as I go through, um, if at the end of my introduction, you would like to share something about your work, please do just what you're doing now and kind of some of the projects that you're working on and how you incorporate youth into them. All right. So first off, we have Molly Sears. Molly Sears is an assistant professor in the Department of Agriculture, Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. Dr. Sears' research integrates agricultural and environmental policy, focusing on improving agricultural productivity while preserving soil health and water quality. Her research agenda is currently comprised of three main components, one being nutrient management application and behavior, two innovations and adaptation in agricultural water quantity and quality, and three agricultural resilience to climate shocks. Her work is stakeholder focused and takes an inter interdisciplinary approach, including agricultural producers, agronomists, and hydrologists to provide valuable context and sound science behind our economic analysis. Um, Molly, would you like to share uh, some of the things that you're working on now, or maybe a little bit more in depth description? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I'm really excited to be here. Uh, a couple of the things that I'm working on right now are, um, I'm working with the uh, water boards in California who have changed their reporting requirements uh, for, for growers in the Central Valley. Uh, they're required to report on the nutrient management practices that they adopt as well as their nitrogen application rates. Uh, it's a really confusing time to be a producer. Uh, it's a lot of reporting requirements, but it's also really essential to help us understand how uh, these nutrients flow into, into different waterways. And so I'm working on kind of every part of that process, working with the water coalitions and how they're implementing these types of reports, working with the state water board and analyzing the data and working with hydrologists to think about how this, this fits into a broader network. Uh, some of the other work I'm doing in Michigan specifically is with uh, retrofitting center pivot irrigation systems, uh, trying to improve water efficiency, energy efficiency, and improve yields at the same time. Uh, and so that's that's where I'd really like to focus my research is kind of both in the agricultural side of things, but also trying to create a more resilient uh, environmental future. Um, so I'm actively working with uh, youth through FFA and 4-H programs, but mostly uh, I'm working directly with producers and, and other agricultural researchers. Thanks, Sam. Oh, okay. So my, I'll introduce myself. My name is Samuel Jan, and then the founder of Jex Company Limited in Ghana, West Africa. A Jex Company Limited uh, within Linda, we are an agro-processing company. The production, processing, packaging, and marketing of vegetables. So what we do is to be able to ensure that we reduce post-harvest losses and also encourage the youth in what they are producing and creating markets serving as a linkage between the producers and also 
the consumers of the finished product of vegetables to increase nutrition and others. In our line of work, we try to be eco-friendly and work with young people within the various communities that we find ourselves. And we do this through the community grouping systems and then through the young people who grow within areas in Ghana. Now within Now, when these vegetables are produced, what we do is that we have our own farm where we produce our own sauce, our own vegetables we need as a backup farm. But aside that, as we've been able to expand our market base, we have producers who produce vegetables like chili pepper, cabbage, carrots, and these. We, they grow and then we are off takers. We have take these vegetables, process them, add value to them, and then sell them in the various urban centers. But for the chili pepper, we buy the chili pepper and then process it through power boiling, grind drying, and then grinding it into a spice so that we expand its shelf life from just the two weeks to over two years for it to be used anywhere in the world. So that is it in relation to Jack's pepper and what we do. In our line of work, we try to be eco-friendly to also save the environment. So we partner with the local poultry farmers around us so that once the uh, animals manure and other things, we get it. They bring these animal manures to our end because it's waste for them and disposing of this waste is a burden for them. But we take this waste at our end. We have a farm plan. We divided our farm into segmentations at every period in time and which one we plow, we prepare the land and then plant. So once, and usually the interval is within two weeks to about three weeks. So once we get the manure, we spread them on this land for a certain period of time. So that at least once we are ready, within that period of time to use it, we plow the manure and the land together. And that enriches the soil. And then once it rains on it and then the dew falls on it, after about 21 days, the acidity in the soil comes down. The soil also becomes very fertile. And then we know that we can plow and prepare the land, prepare our beds before we do transplanting onto it. So this is what we do at Jack's Company Limited, working with various community and adding value to the vegetables that are produced. I'll hand over to Samuel, our moderator. Thank you guys for continuing without me. <laughs> that is kind of strange. I'm at the university right now. It's kind of strange that I would drop the call. Um, Matt, do you still have to go? All right, perfect. So Matt Hall is a researcher at the Center of Community Economic Development who primarily deals with domicology, which is the study of life cycle of the built environment and the distribution of costs and benefits related to building activities. In the past year, he has worked as a landscape designer in Lansing, as well as a urban farmer, co-farmer at Clear Street Regenerative Farms, a small urban farm specializing in fresh vegetables and fruits grown according to organic practices. In December, Matt will graduate from Michigan State University with a bachelor's in landscape architecture. Uh, do you want to describe more of what you do, Matt? Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, so in the past year, I have gotten uh, the opportunity to coordinate a project at um, the Center for Community Economic Development that relates to the practice of deconstruction. Um, so we are taking a deconstruction trainer from um, Oakland, California, and we've received funding to have him conduct training in West Michigan with some roofing contractors that would hopefully allow them to have um, not only the technical knowledge, but a certification in um, taking down a building in a way that preserves uh, up to 100%, but likely around 70% of the materials in the building um, and divert them from the landfill. Um, so this has been a major focus of my research, but in other capacities, I've worked on life cycle assessments, I've worked on um, some carbon accounting, um, and right now for my landscape architecture uh, program, I am working on a master plan for a park in Flint. Um, and there are some specific considerations in Flint um, that we get to um, plan for in that the city uh, does not have the capacity to manage the um, grant administration process. Um, there's not enough labor, so we need to figure out ways for this community to handle funds, hopefully larger funds, um, responsibly, 
uh, in a way that gets the park built um, and provides benefit to all of the people of Flint. Thank you. Thank you guys. What spectacular introductions. I'm sad to have missed uh, half, one and a half of them. Uh, however, let's keep going. Um, so can you guys talk a little bit about how you got started in your role? What was the motivator? Um, and what were the initiatives that you took? Um, and I, we can start with Samuel. Okay, so uh, within my community, I realized that Ghana used to be the sixth largest exporter of chili pepper to the European Union. And then over the period, we produce a lot of vegetables. But the challenge is that due to the infrastructural deficits in Africa, most of these vegetables go waste on the farmland. And that creates a lot of inequalities between those in the urban centers and the rural areas. So food prices are quite higher in the urban centers, but much cheaper in the rural areas. And then chili pepper lifespan when it's fresh has about maximum of 14 days to start going bad. But these are spices, these are basic spices everybody uses. So I sat down with other friends, thought through and realized that no, we can add value to chili pepper. We can process it under hygienic conditions, meet all the various standardization so that we can expand the, spy, the shelf life to more than two years. So we started with a chili farm. We got the pepper, worked with some of the researchers at the University of Ghana to be able to dry it in a very conducive level and then decrease the moisture content to the international level of about 6.5% of moisture content. So in that way, we're able to expand the shelf life of the chili pepper to over two years without any additive, no preservatives, nothing. It's just using dry air to dry it hygienically and then packaging it nicely and then reselling it. So that is what brought about the whole. And when we started, I realized that within the communities we work, it's reduced post harvest losses because their produce were not going back. And then once it's harvested, we had sat down with them, plan their cycle and their farming plan. So we know that at this particular time, within January, we are getting this volume of chili pepper. Then at our end, we process this, those that we sell off, we sell off, those that we can preserve. Because once it's already a spice, it can last for more than two years. And then we sell it off. With time, it grew and then realized, oh, people needed fresh onions. Fresh, they needed cabbage. They needed cucumber. So we added that. So we buy those fresh ones. We grow a bit in our farm so that at least during period where the outgrowers or the people with the rural areas are not able to produce, our farm can supply these materials that we need. Then we bring them to the urban centers. We have a processing unit. We wash them, we package them nicely, and then distribute it to our customers accordingly. So the passion was to address the shortages and then improve the life of the rural areas because they are young people like myself who are farming. And when they finish, there is nobody to buy and all those things was creating challenges. But coming in has brought hope and smiles to their faces and together we are working to improve our communities. Thank you, Samuel. It is, it's always great to listen to everyone's experiences because uh, to me, this is educational for myself. I have a bachelor's in anthropology and Arabic and now own an urban farm. Um, and there are definitely strategies and steps that, and measures that we can take to, like you said, preserve the food, increase the shelf life, increase revenue production, and therefore um, increase production on the farm and build a more sustainable, uh, healthier and happier community that's connected to that farm. So thank you so much, Sam Samuel. Um, Matt, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, so in my capacities, um, conducting research as well as uh, working in landscape design, you know, I've had the pleasure of often being asked specifically to make recommendations for sustainability, which has been um, a great, you know, pleasure for me and I love working in that capacity. But um, a major, you know, it's very important to set up um, systems that can regulate themselves or can continue to um, adjust and, and create long-term sustainability. So it's one thing, right, for, um, let's say a landscape designer makes a recommendation to a city that, you know, your 
stormwater system would be under less stress if you had more diverse rain gardens planted around your city. Um, and that would be one sustainability recommendation. But then the how of that is like a very, very complex and deep sustainability recommendation. Um, if you're able to traditionally, right, you would create a bid and then many people would bid on it and the lowest bidder gets to bid, build all of those rain gardens. Um, but part of our recommendation would be to rethink that. You know, um, generally the lowest bidder might be cutting corners sometimes or maybe um, attempting to create more space for profit out of the bid, you know. So really what we're talking about is, okay, here's our sustainability recommendation. And then maybe we can create a community program that trains people from the neighborhood who already, you know, experience unemployment or have various other pro problems, you know, create a ladder up to greater, um, you know, productivity in their lives that also creates sustainability in our community. Um, so that's always something that I'm thinking about is, you know, okay, I have these ideas about what needs to get done, but what can I do to facilitate it, you know, being sustained, right, over a long period of time. Um, so that's a big focus of mine on, in sustainability is, uh, you know, you have your plans and then you have a system to set it up or some, you know, very clear um, process. Thank you, Matt. I would also like to add that Matt Hall certainly gave me the sustainability environmentalism bug. Um, everything that you explained to me um, just, just blows my mind. Uh, and I know we're going to dig more and more into it as we get into this panel about uh, sustainability and what practices are sustainable. And that's not only in the avenue of the environment, but also in aspects of community um, this is the Global Youth Access Network. We're going to be talking about how we get youth involved and how we get the community involved. Um, so definitely things to think about in tandem with building a sustainable system that doesn't destroy the community that it's in, like you said, like having a good um, like stormwater system. Um, Molly, do you want to kind of piggyback off of that? I know you might have a lot to say. Well, gosh, I, I feel really lucky to follow both of the, the first two speakers here, because I think a lot of what they're doing uh, really speaks to uh, the motivations behind my overall work. So just as a quick background, I, my grandparents were corn and soybean farmers, and I, I spent my childhood summers on the family farm debating with my great uncles about climate change. And uh, I always knew that I was going to be trying to do something that bridged agriculture and the environmental divide. And so when I got started as an undergrad, I, I was an environmental science major and I was working in soil physics and I was doing these carbon sequestration projects, which we might want to get into later too, but uh, it was really neat to see scientifically like how carbon sequestration worked. Uh, but I, I had a lot of questions about that. Um, I, I really wanted to know okay, so we see that carbon sequestration is happening here. Like, what is it going to take for people to adopt this? Uh, what kind of impact is this going to have on overall greenhouse gases? And uh, the work, the folks in my lab were just spectacular. They were like, you know, really these aren't the types of questions that we're able to answer in this lab. Uh, really, you need to be thinking about it from the human, human side as well. Um, and so I, I added an ag economics degree, and that's kind of where everything started taking off. So really the work that I do and I really like to do is kind of understanding the motivations behind adoption of different types of sustainable practices. And so hearing about all the tremendous uh, regenerative agricultural practices that both Samuel and Matt are doing is just uh, both really inspiring to my work. And I'm trying to kind of disseminate that knowledge to kind of bigger agricultural producers who may be less motivated uh, to adopt certain types of sustainability practices. But I think in all contexts, what people want to be able to do is pass down land to future generations that's going to continue to be productive. Uh, nobody wants to kind of ruin that profitable 
accountability aspect of it. And so it's part of my job to encourage that sustainability is the real key to being able to, to have resilient agriculture in the future. Thank you, Molly. Um, that reminds me, and to piggyback off of myself, um, after catching that conservation bug, I certainly dove deep into carbon sequestration, learning all the different methods that are going on now and the technology that uh, is being used and hopefully will be uh, duplicated to implement those methods, ranging from kelp farming, which definitely we can't do on our little Clear Street farm down the south side of Lansing, um, but there are steps that uh, even urban farms, of course, agribusinesses can take uh, when it comes to permaculture, since that over the long run will store more carbon um, than just annual and biannual crops. So that's kind of a little bit of a segue into our uh, next line of questioning. Um, I want to ask you guys what sustainable practices, of course, both environmental and uh, communal, getting people involved in your businesses, getting people involved with your work, whether that's educating, whether that's participation, what sustainable practices have you incorporated into that work? And uh, why not have Molly go first? We'll just do reverse order. How's that? That sounds great. I, I think that's a well-timed question. I'm currently uh, designing slides for a presentation this weekend on nitrogen management practices, and uh, I've got a whole list of 11 for you, so I, I won't go through all of them, but um, a lot of the stuff that um, it, there's so many different kinds of regenerative, regenerative agricultural practices. And I know Samuel has been talking about a few of them with the kind of manure application and, you know, kind of creating a more closed loop system. And I'll, I'll let him talk more about that. But some of the things that we're trying to encourage our producers to adopt are really, really basic. Uh, so testing your soil, testing your water, testing your uh, leaves for underlying nitrogen concentrations so that you know how much fertilizer you actually need to apply to the soil. And so a lot of folks, um, they apply the same amount every year. Uh, they go off of heuristics. Uh, they're worried that if they under apply nitrogen that they won't get a yield boost in a good year or they might not be able to secure a reasonable yield in a, a bad weather year. And so it's, it's a hard kind of set of practices to engage in mentally, uh, but from a physical monitoring standpoint, they're really relatively straightforward. So what we're hoping to do is uh, encourage a bunch of these testing type programs. And then there's a bunch of other really much more elaborate practices uh, that we encourage engagement with, uh, things like cover crops and organic manure application, uh, things like applying nitrogen in ways that are uh, improvements to the overall system. So splitting your application, applying it through your uh, irrigation water, applying it in a foliar manner. There's a variety of different ways that you can um, continue to use the types of nutrients uh, that are valuable for plant growth while trying to be considerate of the overall environment. So those are a few of the ways that we've been trying, a few of the practices we've been trying to implement. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of irrigation specific practices for water efficiency as well, um, but just trying to generate these you know, prairie strips, uh, thinking about all of the ways that we can reduce soil erosion, reduce nitrogen runoff uh, and phosphorus runoff into underlying aquifers, while keeping and maintaining uh, agricultural yields. Thank you, Molly. And um, as we go on, I'm sure that with Matt, we'll probably be talking about um, ways that we can incorporate native varieties to achieve those sustainability goals with the ecology of our environment. Um, and yeah, Matt, just go ahead and take it away. I was going to give an example, yeah. but I'm sure that you'll give the same example. I'm well. sure I'll get there. <laughs> I know exactly what you're thinking of, Sam. Um, yeah, that, first of all, the, pre the slides do sound very interesting about nitrogen management. I would love to take a look at those, but, um, it speaks to something that we butt up against all the time in the, uh, 
you know, in, in our research on building life cycles in domicology is that um, we're looking for a circular model of our economy here, right? Um, because there's so much waste that comes out of a building and so much of it was paid for, we make the argument, you know, there's latent value locked up in there. Um, and it's about how can we extract it? And in fact, in through history, in other places, it has been, um, you know, completely normal to extract that value out of a building at the end of its life. And now we need to go back and figure out how in our current context with our current technologies and the um, tools that we have at our hands now, how do we recreate that? How do we recapture it? Um, and the idea that um, just touch on actually testing our plants for their nitrogen content as they're living and then determining how we apply our nitrogen based on that, you know, is first of all, such a simple and smart idea, but it's also something that, you know, agriculture up to this point has developed without having that ability. And it's clearly useful. We just need to figure out where we slot it in. Um, and similarly, you know, with um, what we're talking about with purchasing manure that goes onto our fields as, um, as nitrogen, you know, that is such a, uh, an example of a circular system that's been set up that used to be practiced a lot. And then there were um, other economic forces that pushed it out of practice in some places, but it really is useful and it's simple and it makes sense. And there's external benefits that you now have a relationship with another farmer who has poultry, you know, and that's access that you didn't have before. And you can coordinate other aspects of your businesses together, which is very important. Um, the circular, uh, you know, business, the circular sustainability business that Sam and I were thinking of that relates to native plant varieties is called wild type. Um, this nursery in Mason, Michigan, um, you know, they are able to, I believe they're a 501c3. If they're not, they should be. Because what they're able to do is collect seeds off of people's property, sometimes of endangered species and species that you normally wouldn't be able to sell in a nursery, but because it's a donation, they're able to take those seeds, grow many plants, and they have a nursery that is all grown from seed, all native varieties that are grown from seed. That's very important because it increases genetic diversity across the entire population. And then they get to sell it all over town, which creates even more genetic diversity and spreads it over a greater area. Um, and so that's, again, another model of circularity in which someone was going to waste this valuable plant and they were likely going to cut it down or, you know, replant something else there. And instead, someone was able to capture that latent value and distribute it, its benefits, it, some of its benefits across town, um, which is very, very, uh, you know, that's the model of circularity that really would work wonders for a local economy. Think about the feedback systems that are created, you know, once that gets started. That got all of us thinking about how can our urban farm engage with native plants? How can we, you know, get into this business that he's already in? What can we learn from him? Um, and it, it just creates momentum in our community that slowly churns towards greater and greater sustainable business adoption. Thank you, Matt. And definitely at the onset of the farm, Matt wasn't there when we actually like co-founded the farm and everything. But at, at the onset of the farm, I was attempting to procure as many um, native or hybridized varieties as I could, just because they are more resilient. They um, produce a better crop given the climate in Michigan and things like that. So there are benefits to even having a hybridized like native and then like European variety of grape. For example, we have some grapes down at our farm. Um, and one of the varieties we use is Baco Noir, uh, which has basically been developed to be grown in Canada. So like very cold climates. Um, and that's one of the main benefits is that they are hardy, they're native, they're part of the local ecosystem, everything that Matt has said. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on, Samuel, uh, do you want to explain the sustainability of what you do? Okay. so. Uh... What Matt and Molly said that key, at least we need to ensure that there is circulation and then sustainable way of doing what we do. For instance, when I started the uh, JEX, 
and we went to, we had our own Nicholas farm that we started with as a base because we were now starting out. And then we went to the community to talk to them. And then some of the community members were like, we've been growing on this land for all these years. Why do you want us to then do this particular activity? Why do you think that, okay, what we do is that we leave our land after growing, we just plow it. And then once we plow it, we plant, and then we apply our fertilizer and get our nutrient. But now you're asking us that, okay, one month before we plow, we should just add the manure, just spread the manure on the land for some weeks, just spread it. And then you've got us a small machine. You want us to just take the machine off the box, put it in the soil and look at the number that will come. So that will text you the number or if the number is low or at this, this level, you should be able to plow or not plow. So it was a kind of education we had to, edit because we gave them an acidity test kit to be able to test, to know the nitrogen components, or if there is high acidity, then they should not plow. If it's low or if it's neutral, they can then plow and then be able to prepare to do their transplanting. So we had to take them through this cycle and then make them understand. Now, one of the things we did within the community, we worked with one community first before we went to the other. And then what we did was that we asked them, okay, when you grow your normal vegetables, the chili, what volume do you get per acre? They were like, okay, we we're getting 3,000 kilograms of fresh pepper per acre. And they were, okay, fine. You will do that same thing. But what we want is if you have five acres, just let's use one acre for the test of what we want to do. Instead of the 3,000, we are going to try our best to make sure that you get 6,000 kilograms of fresh pepper. So if your 3,000 kilograms was giving you, let's say 10,000 Ghana cities, now we are going to make sure you get 6,000 kilograms of fresh pepper, that same land, but higher yield. And then instead of getting 10,000, this time you are going to get close to 14,000 so that there is an, an improvement. But what we need you to do is follow this step. And then in case of any advice we give you, just follow it. So we started, we got the manure to their farm, spread it over 14 days. We realized the dew was falling on it. There were some few rains here and there. And then we test the acidity, which was low, and then they plow the land. And then in plowing the land also, we made sure that they plowed it a certain way vertically. So that once it rains, their erosions are prevented because once there is a plow, the gaps is in there holds the water. And once this water is held there, it serves as water for the plant and it does not wash off the topsoil, which contains the nutrient and other things for them. So once we practiced this and then they planted and the yield came, they realized, oh, instead of our 4,000, we are getting 6,000 kilograms. We are getting 6,500 kilograms. And then we are off taking, we are buying. So once you get that, you, so those who implemented the first phase, we bought everything and then we processed this into the spice. So now on word of mouth sales, they started telling, oh, when this guy said we should do it, although it was tedious, it was cumbersome, it was stressful. When we did it, we had more yield. We made more money from our other farm that we didn't do. So they started spreading it. And then a lot of people started coming, oh, we want to engage. We want to do the same thing. But at the time, based on our capacity, we told them, okay, fine. We cannot deal with everybody. No, we have to be honest. But what we can do is that if you have a certain acreage, just use this one acre or two acres or three, this, based on those acreages we plan, okay, you are supposed to start your nursery this week. The second week of the month, you start your nursery. The third week of the month, you start your nursery. The fourth week of the month, you start your nursery. Because we understood our landscape, our rainfall patterns and everything. These were the knowledge that we were bringing into the communities. So we sat down with them, came out with a farm plan for them. So we knew that at every point in time, because the raining season in Ghana, we have the minor rains, we have the major rains. The major rains usually comes in in July, in June, July, and August. And then we have the minor rains in September, October. Those are minor rains. And then we have our drying season coming, starting from November right down to March. So we planned this with them. And then once they implemented it and they grew, there were changes in the harvest. So that is what made, but initially there was a friction because they were used to farming. They get their seeds, the way they plow their land, they plant. But over the years, they realized, uh, first I had maybe 20 bags of pepper. So what we brought in was that when they grow the average, they were getting like 70 bags of fresh pepper. 
we have uh, bags of 50 kilogram bags that they used. Now they were getting this, they were just bagged, they were no weighing. So we have to bring in the skill system, talk to them. Oh, after you've harvested and you've put them in your sack, you put it on this scale for us. So when you put it on this scale, you write the figure you get for us. So that's what we started with. But with time, we got automated skill where when they put it on it, the readings is directly sent to us with a link. So we get the readings on the farm. So one of the measures we put in place, if you do not put it on the scale, then that means that we will not buy. We have to put in that condition to force people to do because they are not used to it. So now once you see the figure, we tell you we are buying one kilogram at X amount, 10 cities or 15 cities. So once you have the bag and you put the bag on the scale, you multiply it by the amount you are buying 15 cities, you know how much you are getting. And like where you are now going to look for a buyer and all those things. So initially we went through that transition. And then after a year or two, uh, it went well. We got so much pepe that we couldn't because we had not really created that demand in that market. So after a period, we didn't have to just, because we could preserve the pepe and expand the shelf life, we didn't have much of a challenge. We worked on our storage at our end. And then we focused on the marketing bit, created more demand for it. And then we added on process more and then expanded. So there's been this loop and this learning curve within for us because we do a lot of introspection. And then we encourage the community. So we try to also, within the particular community, there are people who are doing animal husbandry. Some are doing the chicken or poultry. Some are doing goats and sheep. We try to, okay, if you use the goat manure within this period, what is the yield? If you use the poultry manure, what is the yield? Then we compare. And then if you mix the two, what is the yield? So over the period within these five years, these are parts of the learning curve we've gone through that we've developed. And then we included the young guys within the various community. Those who can read and write within the community, the JH, the high school graduates, they keep these records. They go around the various community with the pH test kit to test their acidity for them. So they have a roster. Okay, I'm going to uh, a soja mine today. I'm going to this community. When they test, they come back, they type all these things to us. Because if you also don't do it, is going to affect the yield. And that is also going to determine your remuneration that we have to pay you. So these are things that we've structured over the period. And this inclusion has helped us to keep us going and then working with the community. Initially, there was friction, but we were able to overcome the friction. And now at least we are making progress and growing. So this has been the story from our point of view. Thank you, Samuel. That Those are all prime examples of the sustainable development goals that we're talking about today. That is food security, zero hunger, and the other one being a sustainable community. Getting community members out there, getting them involved, um, and using them as a metric, like you said, to show that food security is getting better in the region. Um, and additionally, the education, having like kids go out there with pH te test kits and everything. I'm all for that. Um, I know I definitely didn't get a lot of that when I was in school, but it's something that I like thoroughly enjoy right now is anything really science-y. Um, one of the things uh, you did remind me of, and it is also in line with this question when it comes to sustainable practices and probably something that Matt touched on, as an urban farmer, uh, you only farm on roughly, I think we have maybe a quarter of an acre uh, currently that we farm on. So when you're doing all those crop rotations, it's hard to purchase that manure, get it to the field in the middle of the city, not cause a ruckus with the neighbors and everything and like put it down and like everything's fine. So we of course use composted materials, but additionally um, to that we use cover crops uh, that act as a green manure and return and hold nutrients in the soil. And some of those are still economically viable and generate revenue. Um, peas, for example, are a legume. Uh, edamame, soybeans are a legume and can put some nutrients back in the soil. There's also oats that um, retain soil composition and put uh, nutrients back in the soil as well. And I just wanted to like, add that in there just as, you know, a little bit of spice on top of everything that we've uh, kind of already said. Um, and I'm also thinking as you're mentioning uh, the pastoralism and everything where there's animal husbandry, um, I'm going to turn it over to Matt 
uh, with the next question, but also to explain this example, because I know I can't explain it, and I know that he can, um, an example of uh, silva, silva pastoralism, if I'm talking about it right. I think you know the example I'm talking about with apple trees and the pigs. Do you? All right, yeah, there's um so yeah so basically uh silviculture refers to like um running an orchard where you can um choose nut crops and sometimes fruit crops and things like that that um you know the less favorable fruits that fall to the ground can be grazed by um you know hogs or generally it's hogs that um eat nuts and things like that but in fact like there are um you know, certain like revered, you know, practices of uh, like Hamoni Berico is done in that process where they, you know, munch on on certain walnuts and then they have a certain composition of their body fat that is very desirable um, or at least has been marketed very well. Right. Um, and so, you know, that was um, that is definitely an example of kind of creating more uh, opportunity out of the same space that you are already growing, you know, your fruit trees on, right? And then creating other um, opportunities for animal husbandry. Um, but, and this really is, uh, you know, the example that you just gave, Samuel, was such a, uh, such a great instance of the adoption of these practices, you know, really sometimes the difference is one or two conversations with just one person who cares, you know, and, and if you can sit down and show that you care and you've thought about this and that you really have a plan that is one of the most convincing things that anybody can ever you know experience is having someone right in front of them making the argument to them um and it's much harder to resist you know versus something that a pamphlet you're given or something else um and it's even made stronger if it's someone in your community who's down the road um it speaks to you know like uh one thing that's been bouncing around in my head as we're talking is the velocity of a dollar. And when someone is paid their wage, you know, when they go to spend it, does that money bounce around in their community for a, a couple weeks and then eventually it goes away? Or do you walk right out and spend it on something where the benefits are taken from your community? Um, and that, you know, that is really one of the major, major benefits of circularity and of these relationships at a hyper local level where all of you can coordinate your interests together um, and create some kind of healthy, vibrant local economy where a dollar can bounce around for a week or so. You know, there's me measures of velocity of a dollar are used for, um, you know, creating federal interest rates and things like that. And you can't really, it's very difficult to figure out the actual number at your community, but you can think about it, right? And you can use it in your mind as kind of a heuristic that often when I get paid, I need to spend that money somewhere that is going to extract the, the value, you know, um, rather than being spent somewhere that we can all share it and those benefits are delivered to someone down the street. Thank you for the insight, Matt. Um, and also another perfect segue uh, a little bit into our next question. Um, what are some of the social and political challenges to your works and what are some of the benefits? Uh, speaking as an urban farmer and also uh, conducting a market feasibility study on behalf of urban farmers, understanding where our money is going and how our community spends that money, specifically on food and produce that is grown hyper-locally. Um, what you said, Matt, was very intriguing to me. Um, I will say that as an urban farmer, there are a lot of economical challenges that are brought on by you know, social attitudes of the community, whether or not they are willing to spend a little bit more to buy that uh, hyper-local produce and urge uh, eateries, institutions to kind of adapt a model where they utilize more of that produce. And of course, there's political aspects to it as well as we know in America, uh, a lot of large scale industrial farms do have uh, some subsidized things on their farm by the government. When it comes to smaller farms, it's a lot harder to get that funding, um, you know, for maintenance, for building and construction, for any of those crops. And for an urban farm, it is nearly impossible. So 
a lot of it is that self-starter attitude and really understanding and communicating with your community, which I know everyone on this panel does have. Um, so again, what are some of the social and political challenges to your work and what are some of the benefits that you have seen? Um, and we'll start with Samuel. So, okay, so we in my setting in Ghana, it's been kind of interesting, but so far, what we've realized is that most the fourth republic, uh, the presidents and the political leaders and the government that we've had over the years are now conscious that the population is made up of a lot of the youth. So they are encouraging entrepreneurship and then trying to develop policies to help. And then most of the youth has also been very, very vocal in terms of the things that we need. So currently the government have implemented certain policies and then we are seeking that they look at reviewing some of them after a period for the betterment. So there is a policy, for example, the government wants to encourage most people to go into uh, agripreneur or food processing to add value to most of the food produced so that we can reduce post-harvest losses in our various food crop chain. So in relation to that, what the government, uh, one of the policies they brought was for planting for food and jobs. And in that policy, what they are saying is, okay, if you are a young person below the age of 35 years and you are in a Greek and you are farming, now all the inputs that you need, if you are going to buy the input, once you go with your state ID to prove that you are a Ghanaian and then you have a farm located, you have to register the farm with a district and then you prove then you are getting about 20 to 40 percent discount on your farm inputs but the most important thing is that you have to be recognized by your local districts that you are within their district and you are farming so what we did was to already we had a database of all our local people who were farming our outgrowers the young people and all the people we are working within the community so we led them by the company putting a letter on the list submitting it to the community where they saw that so if any of these members come, whatever that they buy, they are going to enjoy 20 to 40% discount based on that, aside the technical knowledge that we are bringing in. So that policy helped reduce the cost of input for the farmers in terms of, so the seeds. So we encourage, so they were not using the first generational seeds. So now we're using new seeds, improved variety, resistance to other new pets and development and others, which were increasing their yield. That was with the farmers. Now, when it comes to the national level, the regulatory aspects, most of the governmental institutions were working in isolations and each of them is independent, which is good and ensures compliance to RUSA. But there were some of them that we realized that they could integrate their operations. For example, we had the Food and Drugs Authority of Ghana that ensures that manufacturing centers are licenses, they meet the basic uh, requirement, food sanitation, they have SOPs, they have the HACE plan, they implement all the various protocols needed. And then we have the Ghana Standard Authority, which ensures that whatever product we have, we meet the international standard and can meet the international market. Now, when you're a young entrepreneur, when, when I started out seven years ago, if you want a license, you have to go for the Food and Drugs Authority to get a license separate for the product. And then they will license your facility to produce, to sell within the local market and certain market niche, the urban market that we sell in the various shopping centers and shopping mall in the urban centers. But then they were working independent. And then we had a Ghana standard authority. If you want to export to your nearby country outside Ghana, you need the standard authority to give you a license. But these two institutions will come for inspections and realize that they are standardization and they can work hand in hand. So the young people, we came together, formed a series of group, put in a proposal and told the government through our Ministry of Trade that there should be an integration because all these two agencies, the Ghana Standard Authority, the Food and Drugs Authority, are under our Ministry of Trade. And in, so they should come together so that if you start the process and then you are licensed by the Food and Drugs Authority, the Standard Authority should just come and validate their information and then probably grant you your standardized if you meet all their requirements so that you don't have to start the whole process again because you spend like three months getting this license and then come and spend another three months over like six months half year alone on standardization and checks whilst you've done that 
which were limiting our time and our market expansion. Over the period, at least the government has been listening and now at least they work together. So once you are submitting your application, the standard authority will allow you to first go to the Food and Drugs Board. They come for your facility licensing, they prepare their report, their recommendation, and then give you an authoritative note to take to the standard authority that we have vetted these people, we've licensed their facility. So based on that, we are undertaking that you can grant them the license for their standardization. But despite that, you can do a verification test, which has reduced their time and others. So these are conscious governmental policies that are helping. We are hoping that the others that we've recommended with time, they review the policies with the feedbacks that we've given so that it makes it much more easier for the young entrepreneurs in Ghana. Thank you so much, Samuel. Um, for me, it's certainly educational to listen to you talk about those things. Uh, as an urban farmer there, you don't have to necessarily worry about the FDA. You don't necessarily have to worry about the USDA. You don't have to worry about inspections because you're producing on a large enough scale. And typically our markets are like farmer's markets or things that are less regulated. Um, but like I had mentioned, doing a feasibility study, those are things that we now have to understand moving forward if we want urban farming and the reuse and sustainability of vacant lots uh, within urban settings to be reused and be economically viable um, and still supplying that produce all within FDA and like USDA guidelines um, and potentially even exporting that regionally. Um, so amazing insight, at least for me. Um, so let's move on to Molly for the same question. What are some of those social political challenges and some of the benefits you've encountered? Well, I think everything that, that Samuel was saying is really interesting. And I, I wanna kind of touch on one of those points uh, that he made earlier, because I think it's really relevant for the, the growers that I'm working with as well. Uh, when you were talking about kind of showing growers that by implementing your certain practices that yields were actively increasing for them. And that was kind of the convincing motivating factor to have them adopt a practice. Uh, that's exactly the type of situation that we're working with here. So, you know, when I, I work a lot in specialty crops um, and a lot of these nitrogen management practices or fertilizer related practices are um, kind of advertised to growers quite widely uh, and said, you should use this for all of your crops. And when you talk to, to farmers, they're like, okay, you've tested this a lot on nut crops. For example, when I worked in California, nuts are a huge industry. And so everything gets tested on almond uh, orchards, but not very much gets tested uh, when for your small herb producers or your carrot producers or even your fruit and, and tree nuts. And so uh, this is going to be a, a situation where growers really want to see field trial levels of these types of practices. And one of the things that I'm really uh, grateful for in my current position is that I also have an extension appointment besides just being a professor. And, and so in this case, that means that part of my time is actively dedicated to working with stakeholders. And so uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing with respect to soil moisture sensors and smart irrigation technology we're going out in, in blueberry fields and apple orchards, and we're installing uh, these sensors free of charge to different producers and having them use it for a couple of years so that we can see what kind of technology improvements that they're making to the system. And so that's something that uh, hopefully both motivates the individual growers who's been encouraged to adopt this practice, but also influences their neighbors down the street, um, because we all know that the best information sources for growers are other sort uh, other growers in their network. And so that's uh, something that I think kind of relates to all of the different kinds of farming systems that we've been talking about here. Um, it, the internal networks are just super important. Uh, and I'll, I'll give one more example at, with the growers that I, I work with in uh, the Central Valley of California, they work within their water coalitions. Uh, so there are 447 different water basins in California and each one of them are internally organized uh, with respect to how they are 
both allocating water and conserving water for the future. So there are some higher directives, but really organization happens internally. And so that causes a bunch of different kinds of political social issues, uh, but it also allows for a lot of opportunities for growers to actively understand what types of, of problems that they're facing. And so I was working on the central coast of California and they were experiencing seawater intrusion from uh, the ocean. And uh, it was an acute problem that every grower in the basin was actively feeling. And so they were able to adopt uh, a lot more restrictive types of policies than a lot of uh, other folks in California because they were actively feeling the effects of, of seawater intrusion. And so they metered pumping, they installed pretty high water prices, they uh, developed a, a recycled water facility to add ex external sources of water. Uh, and so you can really see that communal effort when everybody both feels a problem, understands a problem, and knows that if they fix it, that will directly affect their future. So there are a lot of challenges out there, but I think one of the biggest things that you can do to overcome these types of political barriers is going with these types of community-based uh, engagement. Thank you, Molly. And what a great reminder that farmers don't live in a vacuum. I feel as though, at least in the United States, a lot of people you know, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, farmers occupy a lot of the rural area in the U.S. and therefore the problems that they're facing, which are all across the board environmental, it can be political, it can be economic. Uh, obviously, the pandemic has created disruptions in supply chains, disruptions in selling uh, those uh, food products, those ingredients to restaurants, eateries, etc. down the line. Um, I, I think that that's a testament in many different ways through what you were explaining, how those farmers are working together and how communities can work together to make sure that we are, um, you know, conserving the food that we do have, conserve, conserving the productive land that we do have, and uh, hopefully being able to feed <laughs> everyone that needs to be fed. So thank you, Molly. Uh, Matt, same question. Yeah. Um, so I guess that I'll just say, you know, up front, uh, so a lot of the workforce development work that I am engaged in is perceived pretty broadly. You know, when I talk to people, it is kind of in a political context, right? Um, when I'm trying to create an effect on an economy like that, it's kind of understood that that's, that's political or it's adjacent to politics. Um, and then in landscape design, it's much more subsumed and, you know, um, you speak to people as, a, as they're, they're your client and you're their consultant, and there's kind of a lurking, hidden politics going on there. Um, highly political process. There's um, lots of permits that you need and, you know, codes to follow and things of that nature when you're working in urban design. Um, and some are better at it than others. There are um, lots of firms that will readily attempt to, you know, um, twist codes or bend them and to positive effects and to negative effects, you know. Um, and so that is one aspect of the process that's understood to be political. Um, you know, one difference between, uh, I grew up in, on the East Coast of the United States, Maryland, and now I live in Michigan. One difference that I've noticed is that in Maryland, there's no um, governmental structure really between city politics and county politics. There's the county and then there's the city and there's nothing in between. Um, and where I grew up, there wasn't a city hall. There was no city politics. There was just the county. Um, and so that had a lot of, you know, uh, there were pros and cons to that um, because Certainly, we couldn't have localized responses to problems as we were talking about, as Molly's example was very similar, you know, you know seawater intrusion in a small area couldn't really be handled um, immediately and as properly by the county as it could have been by maybe a township. Um, but one other interesting component of that problem is the problem of regulatory capture. Um, regulatory capture refers to when there's a regulator or there's some sort of regulation that needs to be enforced. And then those um, firms or bodies that are being regulated are able to exert pressure 
onto the regulator and to, to knock off aspects of their regulation um, that interfere with profit motives. And there have been studies that have analyzed what is the likelihood of regulatory capture on a more complex regulator, right, versus a smaller regulator. So if your township is trying to go up against a multinational company, they would love to deal with your small government versus the, the bigger government of the whole nation or of the whole state, right? And so, um, you know, there are really, really dicey political problems there when the interests of your township are so different from some of the interests of a multinational corporation, you know, um, there needs to be a structure for the township to be able to avail themselves of the power of the state um, or of their, you know, bigger um, geography to protect them. Um, because the township level won't be able to handle it, even though there's a lot of things that they're really, really important to handle. Um, and so that comes in in the building industry, that comes in the agriculture industry, that that's all over. Um, and it's it's something that, you know, really should be looked in the face and confronted. It shouldn't, it's such a difficult problem for the, for the policymakers and for the economic actors, but it's, it's real, it's there and it happens and it needs to be understood um, that, that that's something that you can run into. Thank you so much, Matt, for really elucidating that and explaining that. Um, it's very interesting to see how different levels of politics can certainly impact the work that we're doing. And especially when it comes to sustainability, um, you know, a township, a city, or a county may have different sustainability goals depending on what their community looks like, depending on what their community's own goals are, depending on their community's own political leniencies. Um, so thank you for explaining that and elucidating that because it is a very integral part of kind of the puzzle that we're working with here uh, when we're talking about implementing more sustainable practices and hopefully exponentially so into the future. Um, so I will say we have about 12 minutes left and we have one line of questioning left uh, before we get to the Q&A. So um, let's see if we can make it in 12 minutes. Uh, so the last line of questioning is what are some of the ways you involve the community, youth specifically, into your work? Um, and let's start with Matt. Um, so there are obviously, you know, the community um, development and workforce uh, activity and research that I do is highly, highly geared towards community goals. Um, and we need to work with existing community organizations a lot to, um, you know, one thing that we're dealing with right now is that we have this training set up, but we have way more space in the training, like seats available, like eight more seats that we would love to fill, right? We're going to do the training anyway. And so we really would just like to have as many people there as we can. Um, but we, you know, we want to go through an established organization that's engaged in workforce development, because then we can get eight people from that group right there. And there's a structure to support them um, after the fact, once they have the training. And there's a little bit more of a, we would love to be inv involved in helping them develop their career and stuff. But we don't quite have all of the infrastructure set up to do that. But if we have some other group that that is engaged in that that's in their locality that might help them out um <clears throat> and so uh as far as the landscape design um there is a lot of lip service potentially paid by lots of people to the community involvement aspect um you know generally when you're a consultant, which an architect or a landscape architect is, you're often hired to tell someone something they already wanted to hear, right? Um, they kind of have a goal for what you are going to recommend, and it's best for you to stick to those guidelines. Um, however, often, especially on public projects, um, one of the things that they want is to understand what the community wants. And that's all on you as the architect to orchestrate that process, um, understand and have meaningful interaction with community groups and just individuals, um, and, and to wade through that a bit. Um, because there are, when you're 
client is the township, you know, they're going to have their interests as the government. Um, and a lot of them do align with the community, but sometimes you need to bring that into line. Uh, there's been a lot of research about how you do this. Um, there has been some really interesting stuff that originally came out of game theory relating to the Cold War and um, trying to understand, you know, uh, how people deal with complex decision making relating to like strategy that has actually been adopted for community oriented design um, re regarding game based sorts of things where you lay out a base map and everyone has icons that are like trees or benches or you know play areas or whatever and they get to place them down and move them and then other people get to interact and talk about it um, and that sort of thing is really really valuable and it allows you to talk in clear terms about what exactly on this plan you know what in this park is going to help you um it gets very abstract sometimes and you know it is your job as the architect or the landscape architect to set up a process and a space where people can walk in off the street not knowing anything about the technicalities of what you do and be able to express themselves fully you know uh, which is is very difficult Thank you so much, Matt, and for especially speaking about like the consent of the community for projects and development to take place um, in the Peace Corps. As I served for two years in the Peace Corps, that was one of the main underlying uh, themes and things that they really ground into you during training was every single sustainable program that you're going to be putting into place is going to be carried on by the community so it has to be community driven and community oriented um and i mean that's what we're talking about here I, through fulfilling these sustainable development goals of you know sustainable communities and sustainable food systems leading to food security everything needs to be led by the community and having the community involved so it can be replicated later on and not only just from the ethical standpoint of having the community involved and having their consent and not developing someone out of their own community so to speak um so thank you so much for explaining that um molly would you like to go next Sure, I'll keep mine brief because I think uh, both Matt and Samuel have a lot of really valuable integrated experience with communities. And I think uh, mine comes a lot from both the research design perspective, making sure that uh, kind of the, the research topics I'm engaged in are focused in what's actually going on within agricultural communities and spending a lot of time at grow meetings to understand what kind of challenges are being raised in agriculture and kind of going back and forth with different kinds of focus groups along the way, along with the types of outreach and engagement with kind of field trials and, and experiments on that front. Uh, and so I feel really lucky to uh, have been able to be integrated both into agricultural communities in California when I was doing my grad school work, and now since I've moved to Michigan, uh, being able to be welcomed into the fold because it really is uh, such an important network to be engaged in and also uh, a um, network that requires a lot of trust. Uh, I will also just say that um, I think the other thing that's really important from kind of a youth perspective is just uh, in my work so much of the discussion is around how do we uh, have people look towards the future? And I think a lot of people are really uh, excited about uh, farming practices being handed from one generation to the next. Uh, and so a lot of the folks that we work with directly are technical advisors who are uh, often much younger. Uh, than the growers that they work with and are a lot more motivated to engage in sustainability practices. And we see major shifts in practice adoption as you go from one generation to the next. And so uh, engaging with youth about these types of topics and practicing resilient agriculture is just so dramatically important and something that I'm really excited that, that both uh, Matt and Samuel have integrated so seamlessly into their work. So thank you. Thank you, Molly. And as we see new generations, hopefully um, 
coming into their years and a lot of the technical information and scientific information that's being pursued in your field hopefully will be transferred there and that there's um, of course that trade-off uh, of information and then of course trading off the land uh, for, for, for uh, future stewardship of that land by future generations. Um, so we have about four more minutes. Samuel, uh, would you like to answer the question? Okay, I think uh, from my perspective, we've worked with the young people and then the farmers themselves, the parents who have passed on some of their farms to their children. Some of them, they are high school graduates, are our field officers who do the acidity test. And then when we train them, they go back and retrain some of their community members. So over the period, that's what we've done. And then the feedback we get, we try to improve upon it and other things. And this loop has helped us. And as we go and we learn new technologies, we try them. And I think that with time, we keep improving and then we'll be able to leave a mark in our generation and the young ones that work with over the period can take over. Thank you. And that's the perfect example of putting those technical skills that uh, Molly, of course, researches and develops um, to the test um, and really allowing the youth to learn through example uh, instead of, you know, just through a textbook or something like that. So thank you so much, Samuel, for um, for that. Um, so we're going to be entering the Q&A section here. Um, I'm opening the floor to anyone who is attending to ask any question of any one of these panelists or all the panelists at once. Um, so I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A uh, chat there. And of course, panelists, um, think about some questions you might have for each other as well. There's no reason why we can't be part of that uh, Q&A session. Yeah, all right. So <laughs> um, the it. question was, can can I name uh, the farm in Mason um, where they, uh, it's a it's a plant nursery. Um, and so they have very, you know, robust schemes for propagating out these, you know, plants. Um, it's called wild type nursery. Um, and they do, yeah, they do all native varieties that have been collected from seed, you know, relative. Sweet. Thank you, Matt. Um, I will also say that we went there earlier on in the year and they have a lot of great um, varieties that are fruit producers as well. So there's like, I think there were some apple trees. There was some like huckleberry or something like that. Elderberry, depending on how you process it, of course, you definitely want to process that instead of just eating it raw. Um, and we actually got a few current plants that we planted at the farm. So if anyone's interested in that, all native varieties, all good for the ecosystem in general, but also producing some goodies that you can kind of take home with you and make something with. I have a question for Molly regarding soil carbon sequestration, um, not to crack open the carbon can of worms here, but, uh, you know, I guess my question is just, um, what are the best, you know, cover types, you know, for carbon sequestration in soil? Is this like just like grass that's maintained okay or you know um what do you think about that i i think that's a really tricky question to answer and has been something that's been firmly in the mind of uh, both the government and agricultural producers as they try and think about how to best develop agricultural carbon markets uh, so I'll just give a quick example, uh, like working in orchard crops, um, there's a lot of discussion about how carbon markets might be able to fit into the system. So the nice thing about orchards is that they are in the ground for a really long period of time. And so you're sequestering carbon for all 30, 40, 50 years, potentially. However, is only covering a small surface area. And so having orchards maybe plus a cover crop uh, is probably one of the best ways to kind of keep that in balance. Uh, that can be tricky for different kinds of harvesters and things like that, but there's a lot of discussion about um, kind of doing orchards in conjunction with something like a prairie strip that both 
that tracks pollinator habitat and uh, adds soil carbon sequestration and allows for some of these long-term carbon regenerative processes. Um, now, I will say, like, when you take out a tree, a big tree, you're uh, releasing that carbon back into the atmosphere and replacing it with a smaller plant that takes a long time to grow. It is an important part of the cyclical nature of the agricultural process, but uh, kind of disrupts uh, an overall carbon market. And so uh, that's probably one of the... I hesitate to say greatest examples, but kind of one of the biggest examples of the divide of the challenges for um, uh, carbon related markets and carbon sequestration. Um, I know a lot of carbon sequestration projects are more about like inserting biochar into the soil as well. Sure. Uh, and that, that has certainly a, a variety of effects and, and can also affect the pH uh, of your soil, uh, hopefully in positive directions. Uh, but it certainly needs to be judiciously applied. Um, so kind of a roundabout answer to your question, but, but I appreciate it. That was a good question or a good answer to my question. Thank you. I, I see that Alexandra also has a question. Um, oh, we've got, um, I don't see Dr. Colleen's question. Uh, if we wanted to do that first. Okay. I, um, I I think he sent uh, some questions to me. How long does it generally take for policy that enable agriculture to be approved in your country? So ideally for the Food and Drugs Authority, it's supposed to be a maximum of uh, 90 days, that is three months. For the Ghana Standard Authority also has to be three months. So in all that is six months on condition that you meet all the various requirements. You have your standard operating procedure, you have your HACCP plan, your facility has all the various basic equipment and things that are needed to ensure. So that once they come for the inspections and they check your standard operating procedure, they check your HACCP plan and everything accordingly and they go back and then you run a test for the real product to check the, whether there is equal, there is some Lisa, the moisture content, all the various parameters are checked and it's okay because the Food and Drugs Authority would ask you to go and test outside and bring your test results and then they also run their test to validate what you have brought but the institution you run your test with must be uh, verified and then standardized and then approved so ideally three months but if for example they come for an inspection and there are some recommendations certain corrective measures that you have to take then it means that is going to prolong the process. And then with the standard authority, also, as I said, three months, if they also, so when I did, when we went to, as Jack's company went to the process, we did the standard authority three months, we did the food and drugs authority also three months, so we did six months. But as I stated now, the government, they are working hand in hand so that once you start the process, it's reduced to three months because food authorities tell standard authority, I'm guaranteeing for them because I've gone to, inspect and since both are state agencies working under the standard authority. And then the next question he asks is, are produce packaging facility prevalent in the rural areas? If not, what is the hindrance? Within the rural areas, there are not a lot of facilities, most of because of the infrastructural deficit, because you need access to electricity, water, transportation. And then, so once you put your factory in these areas, it becomes a challenge to move the finished and packaged goods to the urban centers. And also you are looking at constant supply of basic amenities to make sure that the machines can get the maximum use by operating 24 seven within a week. And then when it comes to the urban centers also, your cost of operation will increase because cost of utilities others are very high. So what happens is that most of us have set our factories in between the pre urban centers in between both the rural areas and then the urban centers so that we can easily move the raw materials from the rural areas to the urban center. So within one hour, 30 minutes, we've moved from the urban, the rural area to the urban center. And then from our processing center to the urban areas is about 30, 45 minutes drive. So it makes it very easy and then our timing to move. And then the cost of utility within these areas are very down and very cheap. For example, Accra, we are located at Taifa, which is far away from the 
main urban centers, but it's easy for us to network because the road network and then the amenities are good there. So these are some of the hindrances and others. But then one thing I learned is as an entrepreneur, I look at how to maximize the resources that you have and to get the best and then use the internal look to grow. So these are what, uh, these are the hindrances. If the amenities are there, the infrastructures are there, they are good road network, they are good utilities, electricity, water and others. I don't think we should be able to have a lot of post, we'll be able to reduce post harvest to the minimum. But due to these hindrances, the post harvest losses are quite higher. But then with time, as we work on these things, we should be able to bridge these gaps. Thank you, Samuel. Um, I think that the next question is the one that Molly had seen uh, regarding the amount of nitrogen additives in the soil and what happens if you have too much, too little, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is an important question and I, I appreciate it being brought up um, because this is what kind of creates a big mismatch uh, with respect to, to agricultural production. So basically uh, nitrogen fertilizer uh, it helps improve crop yields it, uh, and, and uh, phosphorus and potassium. Uh, they all improve crop yields. They um, create some resilience to different kinds of weather shocks. It's often an important additive. Uh, it can be brought into the soil in a variety of different ways, uh, either by nitrogen fixing crops such as soybeans or other cover crops. It can be introduced in a variety of manners, uh, but one of the most uh, manure uh, organic materials, uh, one of the most consistent ways is just by applying uh, inorganic nitrogen fertilizer. And so basically what farmers are experiencing is kind of a plateau. Uh, so you add too little nitrogen and yields don't hit their maximum potential and you add too much nitrogen and there's almost no cost to agricultural producers. Now that's a little bit different right now in this market. Uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation has really shot up the prices of fertilizer, but traditionally uh, fertilizer costs are very low and over application of nitrogen kind of serves as like a cheap insurance for farmers. Uh, they don't want to underapply and lose yields. And if they overapply, there are very few consequences for their farm. Um, however, there are a lot of environmental consequences for that. So if nitrogen leaches through the soil into waterways, uh, it can cause blue baby syndrome, uh, uh, potassium and phosphorus uh, issues can cause algal blooms uh, that uh, take away oxygen from waterways. There are a variety of different aspects here that are that are problematic for both human and environmental health. And so that's one of the ways that we want to try and bridge that gap is by ensuring that agricultural production can stay stable because that can induce uh, GERS to kind of reduce the amount of nitrogen that they're applying. Sweet. Thank you, Molly. Um, I'm going to take a look here. Okay, I not to cut it short. I saw one question about nitrogen when it's too much to the soil. What does it do? Mm. So when we started initially, and then we got the test kits, the pH test kits, we added a lot of the manure, checked the nitrogen content, and it was very high. And then the acidity was high, and then we transplanted into it initially when we we're starting the trials. And then we had a field where we waited, we had one week interval, two weeks, we had three weeks, we had one month. The one we transplanted earlier, I realized that when the crop started developing, the leaves started turning brownish, burning up. So it's made us understood that it has high acidity. And that was what was burning the leaves up and everything. And then the one that had one week had the more leaves develop, but then we saw that getting to the tips at the edges of the leaves, that was where it was burning up. So at each stage, we saw different stages. And then we realized that what, when the land where we spread the manure and we had zero, the acidity was neutral and normal. The leaves grew, flourished, greenish. We had a lot of flowers and a lot of fruits coming from there. So that made us understand the baseline of when you apply the manure on the land before you plow, the number of days it should take. And then also we did with the seasons. Because during the minor seasons, the number of periods you should take, the minor seasons, you go a minimum 
of 21 days because you're only having rain showers. So that also affects the moisture content. But during the dry season, that is November, December, if you are going to use irrigation, you go a minimum of 45 days so that the manure takes a longer period on the land because there are no rains, there are no showers. But during the major raining season, which is June, July, August, June, July, August, that it rains a lot. Once you apply the manure, the minimum you can wait is seven days because it rains every day on the land and that dissolves all the nutrients and then takes that off. So those are the things that when we did the trials within the period, we got to realize and learn from the curve. So those are the things we did with. Uh, someone is asking, how do you market link it? Linking smallholder with the market, especially retailers. So for me, there's been a lot of learning curve. Now, what we realize is that in Ghana, there are different market segmentation. We have the traditional markets, which sells within the open market area. We have the malls and then the various shopping marts and others, which also sells. And then we have the food sellers. We have the restaurant, the hotels, and then we have the eateries within our various localities. So all these patterns give us segmentations of the markets. And each of these markets, we develop a marketing model for it. And then we have distributors. Now, when it got to a time that we had a lot of farmers producing for us, we realized that, okay, there is a limit to the volume we can do. So we reach out to the traditional sellers who are within the various localities, the various open markets. They sell heat for loot. But their concern also has to do with that. They want to buy at, the various, at a minimum price for them to maximize their profits. So we told them, okay, if you buy... 10,000 kilograms of pepper from us, dry, because they will, they will not buy finished product from us. They want to buy dried pepper and then they process it themselves into spices. So if you are buying 10,000 kilograms from us, we'll sell it to you at five cities per kilogram. If you are buying less than that, we sell to you at eight cities per kilograms because we've done our calculations and then we know we can make margins. That's what we're selling to them. To the restaurants, we're giving them fresh chilies because they chop these chilies and steam them and cook with. So for them, fresh ones, depending on the grade, if we can harvest today for you on the farm, if we harvest today and you want it fresh that way, you pay a certain price. If we harvest it and we store it in the refrigerator and we bring it to you, you pay a certain price. So we did all these market delineations. And then we have the shopping centers, the malls and all those things. They require the standard authority license. They buy every week, they are buying 500 kilograms. Every Thursday you supply this quantity and they pay us after 21 days. So these are the various market linkage. So we under, we, what we did was to understand our environment, the various market segments, their demand, and then crafted product for specifics with them. That is what we did in terms of our market linkages. Wow, thank you, Sam. And and for me, uh, having, I guess now wrapping up a market feasibility study for farmers to connect with markets, that is very insightful to me and understanding how to really segment that process uh, moving forward. Um, it looks like we only have about one minute left on the panel, so uh, I will turn it over to Luna for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sam, now we have to come to the end of today's roundtable. Thank you all for your attendance and unwaving, unwaving attention. And I will, will send a special thank you to our excellent moderator, Sam, and uh, all of our panel. Uh, it, is a, it is an honor to have you to be to on the panel and thank you for helping make this event such a success and sharing your reflections on um, uh, global food security and sustain sustainable agriculture. Um, Jane, we are continue working for global youth to coordinating opportunities and creating solutions through community uh, leaders, capacity building and content development. So we are looking forward to working with you at future events. And thank you so much. Bye-bye.